Hey there, everyone. Eric Adams here. Uh, I'm a technology and transportation journalist as well as a professional photographer. Now, for the last six months, I've been an alpha tester for the new Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, the software that I'm using here to explore Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, in Central Australia. During this review period, I have come to a realization, not just that this is a great flight simulator, which it absolutely is in a truly next level way that I'll talk about in a, another video, but it's got potential that goes far beyond the aviation and sim community. Most obvious, and which I'll focus on here in this video, are the implications for photographers and filmmakers. These are, in my view, really, really significant. Okay, first, a quick backstory. I typically cover the aviation and automotive realms as a journalist, and before COVID, I routinely traveled about 150,000 to 200,000 miles a year reporting on and photographing new innovations, but also spending as much time as possible doing landscape and travel photography, shooting the cars and airplanes that I'm visiting and uh, experiencing, and more. So I always make it a priority before every trip to learn about the new areas I was traveling to in order to find good locations, understand weather patterns, and just generally study the environment. I do this usually via Google, Instagram, Google Earth, Google Maps, and apps such as the Photographer's Ephemeris, which helps you understand sun and moon rise and moon and sunset activity at a given time and location. So it's this hat, uh, Photographer, that I'll be using to discuss this new flight simulator. Um, though I think much of what I say will also apply to filmmakers as well, and I'll try to note that along the way. And for that matter, my discussion of this program's potential also applies to travelers, adventurers, designers, artists, creatives, event planners, business, governments, cultural institutions, and much, much more, because it turns out that this is a hugely significant piece of software. And there will, I suspect, be a lot of unintended beneficiaries of this program as they discover its capabilities. It's a, it's a truly, it's a titanic achievement, this program, and for a lot of reasons. So briefly, Another backstory, uh, what is Flight Simulator? Let me lay the foundation here, and then we'll bring it back around to photography and filmmaking, um, those two things specifically, a little bit later. This is Microsoft's re-entry into the flight sim world after the software giant abandoned it a decade ago, after about 30 years of dominance. The new program, which is due out on August 18th and is created in collaboration with the uh, French software developer Asobo Studio, it allows you to fly anywhere in the world uh, in a wide variety of airplanes that are all super high fidelity analogs to their real world counterparts. All the way down to the controls, buttons, dials, and their flight characteristics and their behavior in the air. Scenery is critical in aviation sims, and this is the first such program that permits what's known as VFR operation or visual flight rules, meaning that uh, in the real world, usage of that term, pilots navigate using landmarks on the ground, such as roads, buildings, and towers. But in the sim context, it means they can actually practice for those flights using the same exact visual reference points that exist in the real world. And this is only feasible in a simulated environment if it accurately reflects the real world. And here, in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, it finally does. This is the first simulator that truly does this. Now, how do they do that? The program uses data from Microsoft's Bing mapping technology, uh, incorporating satellite imagery, high-altitude photography, and other scanning data processed via AI to create a completely digitally rendered visual representation of the entire world, and that is the real world. All the data for this program is processed in the cloud, and just the immediate vicinity is delivered to the user's computer via a Wi-Fi connection. So. It'll run on even a modest machine, and it doesn't require incredible graphics capabilities or infinite amounts of storage. It generates scenery on the fly, so to speak, because uh, based on where you are and what type, uh, time of day it is and the weather parameters that you've established. So now when you take off in this program in Flight Simulator, you can actually fly above your house. You can check out the 7-Eleven down the street. You can explore parks and mountains and islands and cities as they really are today, or at least at the time of the most recent data update, which Microsoft uh, promises is going to be frequent. Um, you see trees in the real locations rather than randomly generated, and you see buildings and roads accurately depicted. This means you're actually moving through the real world any place on Earth. Now, the data is, of course, better in some areas than others. Major cities tend to have richer data, for instance, and there are many quote-unquote hand-built environments for added detail. Um, 
But the computer does a great job of assembling built and natural environments everywhere on Earth and accurate weather everywhere. Because of this, you can do really like silly stuff like dip into the Grand Canyon in completely inappropriate aircraft or fly under the Eiffel Tower's skirt or try to squeak through the Arc de Triomphe and try that again and again and again and again and then maybe change the aircraft and try and actually get it right that time. <laughs> anyway, uh, behind the graphics, uh, the, the weather uh, is the next greatest achievement here because it's simulated with equal accuracy. You can program in day or night environments and any degree of cloud cover, sunshine, or precipitation. Um, the environments react to the natural light with incredible verisimilitude. The water moves and reflects accurately. Haze in the sky diffuses sunlight. Glare obliterates the scenery around you. And vivid colors emerge at sunrise and sunset in truly gorgeous ways. These aren't uh, pro programmed or painted scenes that they just kind of strip in and the airplane kind of moves in front of. They're generated based on the actual simulation of the weather and light. Clouds generate rainbows if the right moisture and lighting conditions are present. Rain falls and wind blows uh, based on those conditions. You can set up the conditions yourself or even get real-world weather data for the precise moment you're flying. If there's a hurricane somewhere, you can drop yourself into it, if you dare, and experience those kinds of winds uh, and rain. Okay, so that's an enormous and obvious benefit for pilots, both real-world uh, and enthusiast pilots who use this software, or enthusiast flight sim users, I should say, who use these kinds of programs. But what does this all mean for photographers and filmmakers? That's, that's where it gets really hugely exciting for me anyway. This ability to move through the earth precisely and to set up time, date, and weather conditions uh, means that you now have a powerful tool for planning shoots. You can scout locations remotely in ways that Google Earth can't even touch. You can experiment with lighting and weather to find out when you want to be at a location, how much time you'll have to do your shooting before the light changes or disappears completely, and what your optimal compositions might be because you can slew around the environment exploring different angles and elevations and viewpoints. You can move with spooky ease to find your absolute best compositions uh, based on whether or not you can get them. And that might be get to them, may, meaning you can hike somewhere to get to it or even put your drone up and replicate the shot using that. Now, of course, you might think that because this is a flight simulator, you had to do this completely from the virtual air, so to speak, which is meaning from an airplane. Um, and that's not the case at all, which is another part of why this is such a significant product for photographers and filmmakers and creatives. Because Microsoft includes in this program three distinct ways of exploring and examining the real world. Yes, you can fly around in an airplane, um, but most photographers and filmmakers will use that mostly to get the kind of the lay of the land when scouting travel or locations they'll be shooting before advancing to the other two mechanisms that I'll discuss in a moment. Um, also, that bit does require an ability to kind of get your airplane into the air, keep it flying, etc. Uh, Microsoft does include many optional piloting assists that make that as easy as possible. And you can get into an airplane and fly and just keep your speed up and retract your gear after takeoff and a few little details like that, and you'll be fine. Um, also, while doing that, you, you will want to choose your airplane correctly. A 747 jumbo jet won't be a, a great guide through the Grand Canyon, but a Piper Cub or a little diamond aircraft, twin-engine aircraft, would be sensational. Similarly, a business jet might be more agile than a jumbo jet, but still way too fast and kind of cranky at low altitudes and low speeds. A Pitt Special, which is a really groovy, aerobatic biplane will be way too skittish um, and you don't want to fly that around but you'll get the gist of this very quickly and there are other tools that um, uh, are better exploration options for photographers and filmmakers and creatives anyway and the first of those is the slew mode in this you press y on the keyboard and the program flips to a rear view of the aircraft that you can easily move around the world extremely fast at up to a simulated speed of about 8,000 miles per hour. Um, in this case, by the way, I used an Xbox controller for the rapid positioning for the slewing around. But while I'm actually flying, I use a Logitech yoke and, a, and Thrustmaster uh, rudder pedals, which are both fantastic pieces of equipment that I really recommend. Um, anyway, uh, thanks to the slew option, you don't have to take off from airports every time and spend 45 minutes flying to Uluru or Machu Picchu or downtown Paris 
or whatever. You can just zip there, set your altitude and direction, then enter uh, the flight at that point with the airplane already configured in terms of its engine speed and controls. Uh, this is important because Microsoft Flight Simulator doesn't include the same level of uh, intel about the environment that you'd find in Google Earth. Not as many identifiers about locations and street names, etc. It also has, and actually none of those, it also has the navigation tools that pilots use, routes and airspaces and th that kind of thing, but none of the ways that real people will, would try to find their way around. You end up doing this by starting uh, at a nearby airport and, do, and using a map app like Google App or Bing or whatever to um, guide you to where you want to be. Um, you'll pause a lot, kind of look at the lay of the land, look at the map on the sim, and then, you know, acquaint yourself with compass headings. So you know that, say, okay, Yosemite National Park is on a heading of 300 degrees from Mammoth Yosemite Airport or whatever. Overall, you'll spend a bit of time hunting for stuff, but you'll get the hang of that very quickly as well. So, the slew mechanism is an incredible, incredibly useful tool, but even that still doesn't come quite as uh, close to the capability as the third mechanism for exploration, which is the drone mode. And this is accessed through the camera view menu. With drone mode, you essentially become a floating camera that you can move around the world and set up however and wherever you like, even down to ground level. You can adjust the zoom distance, the angle, of, uh, of the camera, the height above the ground within inches, and then fiddle with the lighting, weather, time of day, and more. Um, I've used uh, drone mode to replicate some photos that I've taken, both on the ground and in the air, and I confess my mind was blown by how accurately I was able to do this. For instance, I took this shot of Yosemite National Park in California uh, from the, the Yosemite Valley uh, from an airliner on approach to San Francisco last year, and here's my recreation and flight simulator. It's, it's staggering how, how good this is. And remember, this isn't just a rendering using the um, I image data. This is something that I can move around from that view. It is a 3D digital facsimile of reality. Uh, here's my all-time favorite image that I've uh, taken of Grand Teton National Park. And here's a pretty close facsimile taken a few hundred yards west of the actual spot because the trees were a little uncooperative over at the original spot. So I just moved over a little bit. And sort of replicated it. And the idea here is obviously there's stuff going on in this photo that can't be duplicated in a computer, but to get the composition, to look at the um, options before you go into an area, scan around, find a good spot to shoot, and you get a really, really, really good vibe of what that those composition options are before you even get there. So how do you actually do this? Uh, we'll do a real quick tutorial here using, using as an example the famous Wanaka tree in Wanaka, New Zealand, um, which is uh, this beautiful tree. It's situated a couple dozen yards off the coast of downtown Wanaka, and it's an Instagram famous location, um, and it's a really extraordinary place to go. So to, to do this, you start at the airport, in this case in Queenstown, New Zealand, though there's also an airport in Wanaka that you can start from. Um, and we actually already slewed over there a few minutes ago when I was showing you the slew mode. So here we are back above the town of Wanaka. And I've been there, so I know it's right over here. It's kind of surprising that Wanaka is just like any other small lakeside town with suburbs and fast food joints and this famous little tree sitting a few dozen yards off the coastline right near the downtown area. Anyway, fly to your general area and then you switch to drone mode by using the active pause button function to stop the flight and that's another incredibly useful tool in this program active pause because it allows you to just stop what you're doing change everything and then restart um like change the weather change the lighting change the time of day change the year etc and then restart your flight so anyway uh, then you open the camera menu and hit showcase which will put you in the drone mode and this uh, defaults to a very slow drone speed so you got to remember to bump that up to at least 50 or 70 percent otherwise you'll be crawling along then you just fly over to the tree hover down to the shore where you you know where you'd be when you're actually there and start exploring angles and compositions you can adjust the zoom you can adjust the zoom level and even and assign that osobo and microsoft knew this would appeal to photographers camera exposure autofocus and even depth of field uh, you can then work with the natural lighting to see when's the best time of day and experiment with different cloud covers the tree itself isn't yet precisely rendered or quite right there in terms of height but you get the idea the it's not at this at ground level, it's not going to be perfect, but you can, there are objects there and you can compose kind of around them.
Of course, the point of this isn't to recreate shots as I'm doing here. That's just a demonstration. But uh, to be able to pre-plan your shooting before you go out on an assignment or a project or whatever. You can even experiment while actually out in the field, assuming you've got a laptop and downloaded the data for that specific region. Now it'll allow you to work offline with full graphics capability. And let's try another example closer to home in New York City. This time I took off from New York Airport and then hopped into the drone mode to get a bead on some of the different perspectives of the city. I began with Liberty State Park, which I've shot at frequently in real life, and experimented with different helicopter angles. Um, as I, I and several occasions have gone on helicopter flights around Manhattan to do some, you know, golden hour photography of the city, and a lot of people do that. Um, uh, so in this case, you can line up things before you go on your flight, get a few ideas, print out a screenshot, and hand it to the pilot before your flight to see if he can get you there. Keep in mind, this is a $60 program, people. <laughs> this For what this does, that's nothing. Uh, you can upgrade to the $80 or $90 version and then the $120 version, but all that gets you is more detailed airports and additional aircraft, which for photographers and travelers and adventurers and creatives who are using this program to visualize the world, you don't need those enhancements. So you can get all of this, every bit of it, for $60. You don't have to pay for additional scenery or whatever. Um, also, uh, going continuing with the New York City, the, the solar and lunar positions are accurately rendered. So you can precisely replicate things like the famous Manhattan Henge phenomenon in which the sunset lines up perfectly with certain east-west streets in New York City. It won't simulate solar eclipses, though, which is a bummer for me because that's something I'm kind of all about and do a lot of travel and photography around. But maybe if they spin off a version for creatives, they'll add that capability. Um, a few more quick examples. Uh, Yosemite National Park. Flying through the valley and checking out the tunnel view. Um, you can set up a perspective that only a drone could get. Um, or you can go down to ground level, such as at the tunnel view, and find some possibly even better alternatives in that area. If you hike up this hill or go down the, to the valley below or up higher or whatever. Um, Monument Valley, you can uh, learn the three towers, uh, try to try them different times a day work on, and different times a year, work on alternative perspectives from the surrounding terrain, etc. And get a really good bead on what your options are because you go to the visitor center, you get that classic view. But that's a very familiar view. Um, and so you can walk along that ridge back and forth, or you can go down into the valley and find other places, or you can put your uh, drone up, depending on the legalities of doing that, you know, offsite, uh, outside the park, or whatever. Um, so all of this, all of these capabilities have me incredibly excited about how we'll be able to use this in the future. Um, assuming travel one day returns to some degree of normalcy. Uh, but it will also help uh, help me as a traveler, as an explorer, as an adventurer, whether close to home or on the other side of the earth. The software literally puts the whole world at your fingertips in a way that you orchestrate and control. For that reason, I can easily see this tool drawing a lot of interest from other travelers and adventurers who are planning trips or scouting locations themselves, regardless of whether cameras are involved at all. Furthermore, I can see it being immensely useful for commercial businesses who are working to understand the environments they might be working in better. Artists and creatives, as I mentioned, looking for inspiration. Scientists and researchers looking to simulate natural environments or studying geography or geology. Uh, military search and rescue and other entities that might need a tool like this for training or planning purposes. Uh, and there are limits to all of this, of course. The greatest one being that the program isn't actually designed for any of these uses that I'm discussing here. It's designed as a flight simulator. And when I'm describing to you now, uh, what I'm describing to you now are simply my own alternative use scenarios. So all the functionality and all the language and vocabulary is perfectly understandably crafted with pilots and sim users in mind, not photographers. So things like the zoom settings are in percentages of something, not millimeters of focal length or field of view. A version of this program designed for photographers and filmmakers uh, would have things like lens options and true camera settings and exposure data, all of which is certainly possible should Microsoft and Asobo decide to spin off this idea for other markets. Additionally, it would be great to have, say, a mechanism for recording GPS data, flight paths, and these uh, camera settings for the images. Um, now, a lot of this is present. Like when you, the, the great thing is that when you lock on to a, a composition that you're very excited about, you can just you can capture the exact time of day, and exact location, um, 
that you're at. You can do all that, but it's not quite as user-friendly from that perspective uh, as it could be. Um, a better way means of wayfinding and identification of landmarks would also be useful in this scenario. And right now you do a lot of guessing and looking at maps and, and maybe there are ways of doing this better in this program that I just haven't discovered yet. Um, but there, it is a very uh, aviation way of navigating around the world, not a person on the ground way of navigating around the world. Um, and another detail to be cognizant of, uh, cognizant of is that you can actually explore at ground level too you'll quickly run into some of the limits of the program in many locations. And you can do that via drone mode at ground level or even by landing and just, believe it or not, taxiing down the street as I do here on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Now, obviously this isn't a fair assessment of the program's scenery rendering capabilities because it's not meant to have that sort of granular detail at street level, but it's fun nonetheless in that post-apocalyptic way. I especially love here that the billboards are present, which can be a handy way of dating the data sometimes. Um, now, ultimately, a version of this dedicated for the uses I'm envisioning here could also dispense with the aviation component entirely and simply be a slewable drone-like camera with all the scenery and weather capabilities from flight simulators still present. In that case, you won't have to worry about stuff like stalling and overspeed and angle of attack indicators and stuff like that. You don't have to actually keep your avatar, you, alive in the sim just to find a good camera position. Um, but in a way, um, that actually would diminish the whole experience quite a bit too because part of the pleasure of using Microsoft Flight Simulator is as a photography and filmmaking tool is the fact that you're able to simply fly around these beautiful environments in whatever conditions you like at a leisurely pace and that experience alone can lead you to new places and nudge your creative instincts in different directions. In fact, over the last six months, while I've been experimenting with this program as an alpha user, I found it has helped me immeasurably coping with the pandemic and the confinement that we're all enduring. I typically travel almost constantly, and I miss that sense of exploration and that wonder that you get through travel. And while this doesn't replace, obviously, real travel and real experiences, it does give a sense of the world you choose to explore, both from above and at ground level, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's, it's a fantastic experience to go around and look at the world through this simulator. You, you learn so much. You see cities. You see um, Paris, London, New York. But also, you know, in this case, I'm flying through Dakar in Senegal, which I visited a couple years ago. And it's amazing to see how true to life this is. It is exactly what I experienced. Now that kind of brings us to the end of what I wanted to say about Microsoft Flight Simulator in the, in the context of photography and filmmaking and creative use. I really recommend you check it out, give it a chance, look at some of the uh, uh, videos and clips that are out there and, um, and look at your own work and see how this might be able to benefit you. Um, now just FYI, I'm not actually paid by Microsoft to say any of this. This is my own gut feeling after spending the last six months in quarantine using this program as an alpha tester and wondering how, or I should say realizing how real it is and how easy it is to use this as a tool for planning my photography. Its capabilities are truly profound and its impact could be huge way beyond the aviation crowd. Now that might be hyperbole, so I'll let history and you set me straight on this in the future. So let me know if uh, in the comments below whether you think that as a creative this might actually be useful for you or whether I'm just completely out of my gourd. But anyway, thanks for watching and have a great day.